Hello everybody and welcome to this Chatham House members event on how protest movements make change, the latest instalment of our centenary historian series. My name is Ben Horton and I'm a communications manager at Chatham House where I also lead the Common Futures Conversations project, which brings young people from Africa and Europe together to discuss the major political issues facing our world. As you can imagine, much of the conversation in recent months within that project has focused on Black Lives Matter and the global wave um, of protest movements campaigning for an end to systemic racism and police brutality. Um, it therefore feels like a really important time to be considering the impact of mass protests within democratic systems. And we've lined up a fantastic panel today to discuss this. Drawing on contemporary and historical examples from across the globe, this panel will consider the tradition of protests and assess how we move beyond protests to enact meaningful change. Um, so to discuss this today, we've got some fascinating speakers with us. Um, joining us from the UK, we have Dr. Nadine El Anani, who is a senior lecturer in law at Birkbeck School of Law and the co-director of the Centre for Research on Race and Law at Birkbeck University of London. She is the author of Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire and co-edited After Grenfell, Violence, Resistance and Response. Nadine researches in the fields of migration and refugee law, European Union law, protest and criminal law and justice. Uh, she has published widely in the field of EU asylum and immigration law. Her current research project, funded by the Lieberholm Trust, uh, focuses on questions of race and criminal and social justice in death in custody cases. Also with us today, we have Siswe Mpofu Walsh. Siswe is um, a South African author, musician and activist, and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Witwatersrand uh, in South Africa. He holds a DPhil in international relations from the University of Oxford and is the author of Democracy and Delusion, 10 Myths in South African Politics. Um, and in 2016, Siswe was part of the Roads Must Fall campaign um, in Oxford. Uh, and also joining us today um, from Baltimore in the US, we have Dr. Stuart Schrader, who is the Associate Director of the Program in Racism, Immigration and Citizenship and a lecturer um, slash assistant research scientist at John Hopkins University. At John Hopkins, Stuart teaches courses on police and prisons, black social movements and critical race theory. Um, and he is the author of Badges Without Borders, how Global Counterinsurgency Transformed American Policing, which examines the relationship between US projections of power overseas and the rise of the carceral state at home. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to our fantastic panel. Um, we're going to start uh, now with uh, Nadine El Anani for some opening remarks on this question. Um, Nadine, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to Amrit and everybody else um, involved in inviting and organising us to speak today. And thanks to everyone who's, who's tuned in. Um, it's a very hot day in, in Britain today, so um, hope you can all bear with us. So yeah, I'm going to start by outlining um, uh, briefly how the right to protest is protected in law, um, very briefly, um, before then um, turning to the history of, of one aspect of how the criminal law has been used to suppress protest activity in Britain. And I'm just going to close with a few comments on how I see this narrative connecting and also kind of um, resurfacing how we've seen it resurface with the recent Black Lives Matter uprising. So um, just, just to give the, the sort of legal basis for the right to protest. Um, as probably most of you know, it's protected in the 1950 European Convention on Human Rights, um, which is incorporated into UK law by the 1998 Human Rights Act. And Article 10, which protects the freedom, the, um, protects freedom of speech, and Article 11, um, freedom of assembly and association. And the two taken together provide the foundation for, for the right to protest in legal terms. And of course, there are um, there is a potential for restrictions um, that are permitted in relation to these rights, which have to be prescribed by law, necessary in a democratic society, including those aimed at protecting national security, public safety, or for the prevention of disorder or crime. And it's particularly, um, disorder or crime that I'm going to focus on um, in my critique today of how uh, Britain um, historically um, and until today um, invokes uh, disorder, the notion of disorder 
uh, as a means of depoliticizing um, protest activity and indeed targeting uh, protesters. So the scope of the freedom to protest depends um, in part on the way in which it's legislated and Britain has a long history of criminalizing protest and resistance movements in its colonies and on the mainland. I'm going to focus here on a piece of legislation that has been used increasingly over the past decade on the British mainland to target uh, protesters and this is the 1986 Public Order Act. When the state or the, or the empire's power has been challenged or threatened, the authorities will often resort to the powerful ideology of criminal justice and a discourse of law and order as a means of depoliticizing that resistance in order to present it as a question of individual wrongdoing and disorder rather than one of legitimate political contesta contestation or indeed uh, radical protest activity designed to achieve um, uh, systemic and structural change. So until the late 18th and early 19th century, the British state's method of limiting speech, in particular that against the state or the church, entailed prosecutions under the law of seditious libel. But by the late 18th century, it was becoming increasingly unacceptable in Britain to limit what could be said in the form of political speech or, or dissent. And so the state was working hard to find another way to retain its hold on power in the face of growing political opposition. Local authorities at the time were particularly concerned about the gathering of large crowds at rallies and marches. And it was with the Peterloo Massacre of the 16th of August 1819 that the way was paved for the use of public order offences against protesters. The 60,000 people gathered in St Peter's Fields had come to listen to the orator and reformer Henry Hunt on the subject of parliamentary reform and the extension of suffrage to all men. Despite the peaceful demeanor of the meeting, the 1714 Riot Act was read and the participants were forcibly dispersed by military officers on horseback wielding sabers. According to the Riot Act, after it was read, justices and their servants engaged in efforts to disperse, seize or apprehend rioters were free, discharged and indemnified for the killing, maiming or hurting of such person or persons who resisted. In total, 11 people were killed at Peterloo and more than 500 were injured. The common law offence of unlawful assembly that was then elaborated in the course of the Peterloo trial, so the trials that were then brought against um, uh, speakers and people who were engaged um, in organising, involved in organising and, and, and participating in, 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 the, um, in the rally, um, in the course of these trials, this common law offence of unlawful assembly was elaborated. And it's a largely unacknowledged connection between current public order offences and that, that are used today against protesters and the laws of that, of that time, which obviously today are widely regarded as being particularly repressive. Of course, we can, we can argue that um, we see the same level of oppression today. But, it, but, but, this, but this connection between um, what is assumed to be an age where there wasn't a, the idea of free speech and people were um, being prosecuted um, under seditious libel for, for things that they said, um, um, those very same laws that were developed in that period um, have their own iteration in place today, and, and I'll come to that. So the offence of unlawful assembly um, was useful to uh, uh, lawyers at the time because it had a depoliticizing effect. It allowed the government prosecutors to focus on the behaviour of protesters rather than solely the content of what they said. And so by fo focusing on the disorderly manner in which political opinion was expressed or a disorderly manner that might be read onto an activity that had taken place, the authorities could divert attention away from the political nature of the charge. So large crowds were assumed to be violent and treacherous simply by virtue of the number of people present. So after Peterloo, the Lord Chancellor told the Lords that numbers constituted force and forced terror and terror illegality. The assumption that crowds are an inherent danger underlies public order offences that are currently in force today that of course found their origins um, in, in, in the offence of unlawful assembly elaborated after, after Peterloo. So for the offence of riot, violent disorder and affray in the Public Order Act, a certain number of individuals have to be present together. So 12 for riot, three for violent disorder and two for affray, and then the offence can be triggered. So in the case brought against Henry Hunt in the wake of Peterloo, the prosecutor quickly did away with the argument that those who had gathered at Peterloo had a right to free assembly, invoking what he argued to be an inherent danger and unpredictability in the gathering of such a large number of people, particularly, he said, of the working class. 
Justice Bailey held that, peace, that the peaceful assembly at St. Petersfield's was unlawful because it was seditious and therefore created fear amongst the public. However, it had not actually begun before it was attacked. And this is crucial. Um, so, so how could it be said that it was itself seditious? Um, it couldn't have actually be shown itself to have caused fear. It was unlawful, the judge said, because the seditious words intended to have been spoken would have occasioned fear. So the rationale for the ruling was a reliance not on actual fear, but on hypothetical fear. The hypothetical fear on which Hunt's conviction was based plays a key role in the modern offence of violent disorder of which unlawful assembly was the precursor. So section two of the Public Order Act of 1986 provides that a person is guilty of violent disorder where that person uses or threatens violence that would cause a person of reasonable firmness present at the scene to fear for his personal safety. But importantly, no person of reasonable firmness need actually be or be likely to be present at the scene. And of course, if we think about protest activity, usually people present at the scene alongside the demonstrators themselves, um, who are of course unlikely to be afraid of each other, are of course exclusively police officers, often dressed in riot gear and carrying weapons. So the thought that fear might be occasioned um, is quite unlikely. So it's rather, it's important that the event includes this notion of, of it being um, no person um, of reasonable firmness need likely to be present at the scene. Um, so unlawful assembly, as I mentioned, was a forerunner to violent disorder. And this offence of violent disorder is the offence of choice um, for the Crown Prosecution Service when prosecuting protesters today. It carries a maximum term of five years imprisonment. And despite being very similar to the offence of unlawful assembly, it's quite telling that the name of the offence was changed to violent disorder. So from the common law offence to its statutory um, iteration because the violent disorder reflects the moral reprehensibility of the offender rather than the illiberalness of the state, which is suggested by the notion of unlawful assembly, which seems to really fly in the face of a notion of a free assembly or human right um, to associate with others. So by prohibiting violent disorder, the state is purporting to maintain order for the good of the wider public rather than restricting the right to assembly. So entailed in the naming of the offense is also the idea that so-called disorder is necessarily violent Despite evidence of indiscriminate baton use and heavy policing at public order events, order is still habitually equated with the state and legitimacy, whilst the imaginary violence of the crowd tends to be understood as disordered and illegitimate. And I, I sat through a lot of the student protests and the students who were, who were prosecuted um, after the Antifa's protests of 2010. And it was really clear in the language that the prosecution um, would use around the behavior of the students because they would say to them, when they were questioning them, you know, we understand that you have very strong feelings around um, not charging fees and education being free, but it's the way that you protested, it's the way that you process the issue. And you could really see this depoliticizing um, discourse present in the way in which the, um, the, uh, the, the, the offense of violent disorder is, is, was operationalized. And so the practice of using violent disorder charges against protesters took on um, a greater frequency following the protest against George Bush's visit to the UK in uh, June 2008, after which 12 protesters were charged with violent disorder. In 2009, we saw 71 young people with no previous convictions who participated in protest against Israel's assault on Gaza um, being charged with violent disorder. 64 pleaded guilty and received prison sentences. However, importantly, of the seven who pleaded not guilty, six were acquitted. And I'll come back to why that's important um, um, shortly. Um, before uh, George Bush's visit and the use of violent disorder to target those protesters, um, individuals ar arrested at protests would usually be uh, given cautions or tickets and fixed penalty notices. Um, and in 2010, there was a stream of cases of protesters charged with um, violent disorder following the anti fees protests, as I mentioned. Of those 27 um, charges of violent disorder, um, 14 of the 15 who pled not guilty were acquitted. Three other cases were dropped and three were reduced to lesser charges. And so what we have to consider here is the question of overcharging. Um, because of the pressure that's put on individuals to plead guilty, um, overcharging, so charging more serious offences or charging behaviour that doesn't, that doesn't need to be charged, um, leads to the very likely possibility that individuals are wrongly criminalised um, 
imprisoned and, in, and of course for disproportionate lengths of time because as I mentioned violent disorder carries a, a maximum term of five years it's very likely if one is convicted of violent disorder that there will be a prison sentence that follows. So the use of the Public Order Act against protesters has significant political implications in serving to divert public attention away from the political message of protesters and instead pre prevent, presents them as having engaged in disorderly and criminal behavior. In the face of political opposition to unpopular government policy, a government mindful of public opinion might perceive an interest in presenting those protesting as disorderly, violent and engaging in criminal activity rather than exercising a right to free expression and assembly. So just to conclude, um, we saw the same depoliticizing law and order discourse deployed following the 2011 riots with some very serious consequences for people who had participated in the riots in terms of the um, overnight um, courts that were run and the lengthy, lengthy disproportionate prison sentence people are still serving in connection with those riots as we just pass um, another anniversary of those riots. Um, and of course, those riots followed the police killing of an unarmed black man, Mark Duggan. So again, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter um, uprising that we've seen um, uh, following the killing of George Floyd, it's particularly um, um, important to consider how we still see people, we, we still have people incarcerated um, as a result of participating in those protests back in 2011 today, as we see indeed another um, uprising, Black Lives Matter uprising. So. In response to the recent um, protests, officials have pushed the narrative that the problem is not the political opinions of the protesters or their wish for um, uh, anti-racist outcomes, um, but rather the manner in which they protest. So we saw in the toppling of the statue of slaver Edward Colston in Bristol, the anti-racist demand that the statue be removed can ostensibly be entertained, officials say, um, but through official processes. Um, of course, you know, no official processes had yielded any results until this point or indeed been instigated until the actions of these protesters. But that seems, of course, unimportant in the discourse. Rather, officials have sought to focus on the disorderly behaviour in taking the statue down. And as we know, Boris Johnson said that those protesters should face the full force of the law. So it's important to resist this depoliticizing narrative that constructs protesters as criminal or violent. The sort of direct action we've seen in the course of the Black Lives Matter protests in Britain, in the UK and elsewhere, whether in the form of taking statues down, burning symbols of corporate greed and looting, are the very forms of resistance that tackle the core of structural racism. While the law constructs protest as criminal and having desecrated public monuments and having damaged property, in reality these protesters are engaging in powerful acts of resistance which are themselves part of a long history of anti-colonial resistance and of course that's the other important side of history that has to be brought into to this question against centuries of violence and destruction of racialized people, their persons, their culture, their freedom and their humanity. Thank you. Nadine, thank you so much for that opening. Um, I think I'm going to move straight over now to uh, Stuart Schrader um, to give us uh, a similar kind of overview, but from more from the US perspective. Stuart, thank you so much. Thanks so much. And it's, it's great to be here. And, and I'm, I'm happy to participate in this panel. And I think what I'll say right now will build a little bit on what we just heard. So today happens to be the 50th anniversary of the assassination of a US police advisor in Uruguay, August 10th. His name was Dan Mitrione, and he was killed by the urban guerrilla group, the Tupamaro Movement for National Liberation. He'd been abducted about 10 days prior, held in a secret location, interrogated. And this was a major event at the time. It garnered a great deal of attention in the press and obviously in the foreign policy establishment of the United States, um, going all the way up to, to the, the Oval Office. So I wanna use my, my few minutes today to use this incident and, and this anniversary to reflect on, on what this history leading up to and then following the assassination might tell us about contemporary protest dynamics and policing, particularly in the, in the US. So Mitrione, Dan Mitrione was a veteran police officer. He had worked in Latin America advising police on behalf of the United States for around a decade at the height of the Cold War. Uh, his employer was an organization called the Office of Public Safety, which was housed in the Agency for International Development. The Office of Public Safety was the overseas police assistance arm of the United States government. And it, it existed in various forms for 
around two decades. And at its height, it was advising police in dozens of countries around the globe. And it also operated a training academy in Washington, DC, and uh, 77 countries from, from across the world sent high-ranking police officers to the police academy for training. Some of the training consisted of relatively mundane police tasks, um, administrative recommendations, um, and some of it was more secretive and uh, specialized policing techniques. Um, the Office of Public Safety basically, in addition to training, supplied a lot of materials to police around the globe. Some of that material, again, ranged from the very mundane, things like handcuffs, to more sophisticated communications technologies, and of course, weapons ranging from standard pistols to uh, more sophisticated and advanced uh, weapons. Now, the Office of Public Safety, particularly after Mitrione's killing, was painted as the nefarious covert arm of the CIA used to you know, reach, reach into uh, the, the politics of the countries that were being assisted and used to institute political repression. In some ways, those accusations were actually true, but the Office of Public Safety was guided by a principle that tried to reckon with the advance of modern communications technologies in the middle of the 20th century. And this principle was that when police were trying to control public protests and demonstrations, the best approach was to avoid brutal and wanton violence toward peaceful protesters and bystanders. The risk, according to the Office of Public Safety, was that if police were too harsh and too brutal toward protesters and protesters were killed, that would create a so-called martyr. The idea was, according to their understanding of politics at that moment, the idea was that the communist movement around the globe was always itching to or eager to have a martyr that it could use in its campaigns that would then be able to discredit and delegitimize the government. So the, the, the consistent principle was, you know, avoid creating a martyr when dealing with public protest. And what's interesting is that when Mitrion himself was killed, the US government and the Uruguayan government actually used his memory um, and used his kind of martyrdom in the Cold War to try to discredit the left and to paint the left as, as bloodthirsty and cruel. But how did uh, advisors like Mitrione and his colleagues um, introduce this, this principle of avoid creating a martyr? Well, in Uruguay, where, where he ultimately uh, ended up getting killed, police traditionally approached public protest in a pretty aggressive fashion. Oftentimes, police on horseback would confront demonstrators with sabers or, or swords. Now, obviously, this was violent and it could lead to grave injuries. So Mitrion's colleagues in the Office of Public Safety, beginning uh, in the middle of the 1960s in Uruguay, started to recommend new approaches to crowd control, modernizing crowd control techniques. And one of the main tools that they recommended was tear gas and particularly the chemical CS, which is ubiquitous today in crowd control, but was uncommon at the time in Uruguay, as well as in many of the other countries under the advisement of the Office of Public Safety. So soon, tear gas um, started to be used with great frequency. But the problem was that in Uruguay, which was, was a democratic country, um, with relatively high levels of political pluralism. The problem was that Uruguayan police started to stifle legitimate forms of protest, particularly using tear gas. Student demonstrations, labor strikes would often be met with um, you know, copious amounts of, of chemicals that would disperse the crowds. Now, according to the principle, no one necessarily was getting killed, but the, the, you know, the, and the chemical didn't leave a mark necessarily, but the protests were essentially prevented from occurring. The government was 
was not autocratic, was not authoritarian, but the police were preventing protest um, from being able to, to occur. So as a result, a number of young left-wing radicals feeling that traditional modes of protest, including the labor movement, were not um, effective, be, were, were no longer effective because of, of this police response, they started to go underground and they started to form organizations that were not operating on a traditional political uh, terrain, including the Tupamaros. And this organization began to focus its anger and its political tactics on the police. And this meant sometimes um, nonviolent, but nonetheless um, shocking uh, tactics. They would show up at police officers' homes, um, you know, late at night and, and try to harangue the police officers into quitting their jobs. And they would also do things like breaking into police installations, stealing weapons, um, stealing uniforms, and so forth. So in time, the police repression increased, and with the help of, of US advisors, hundreds of militants across Uruguay were identified and ultimately arrested. And this only increased the militancy, where now this underground organization felt that so many of, of, of the members were being arrested that they needed to try to um, undertake audacious acts that they could then uh, use as negotiating tools to try to win the, the release of some of their comrades who are imprisoned. So this chain of events unfolds that ultimately leads to the abduction of, of Mitrione uh, at, at the end of July and, and, and then after he was held for a number of days, um, eventually, and, and in the process of searching for him, many of the members of the organization, the police searching for him, many of the members of the organization were, were arrested, which left the, the organization um, basically desperate, confused, and, and ultimately they, they made the foolish decision to kill Mitrione, which of course only sparked even more intense repression. But the the leader of the organization, some years later, after he was eventually released from prison, he reflected back on this period of the, the 1960s before the, the kidnapping of Mitrione. And he remarked, you know, it was the repression that we experienced that spurred our resistance. And I think that this is an interesting lesson because not only was the resistance spurred by repression, but then the repression itself um, became part of a cycle that was quite difficult to end. And ultimately, as, as many people will know, Uruguay um, turned into a military dictatorship beginning around 1973 that lasted into the 1980s. And it was an extremely harsh and repressive society. And it wasn't the only, of course, military dictatorship in the Southern Cone. Um, but one, one aspect that kind of distinguished the, the Uruguayan regime was its use of um, imprisonment. Political prisoners, which you know, were, were, were arrested beginning in the 1960s before Mitrion's assassination, that technique just lasted uh, for, for years and years and years, and more and more people were, were arrested. Of course, further stifling any possibility of of legitimate um, democratic protest and demonstration. So of course, we are not in the United States where I am right now, we are not in the same type of situation as Uruguay in the 1960s and 70s. But I do think that there are some lessons that we can take from this experience as we observe what has been happening in the United States over the past couple months, with the Black Lives Matter protests in, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. What I would argue is that um, we are not actually seeing the uh, introduction of the types of underground militant activities that characterize the Tupamaros. The United States is, and, and I think just generally, um, a lot of developed countries like the United States are not in, in a situation where this is necessarily the risk. But on the other hand, it is certainly the case that the stifling of protest 
um, through really harsh and repressive means is inciting greater protest. That has been the cycle over the past couple months where police have, um, have engaged in such harsh techniques that it has bolstered the size of the crowds and actually given the, the protests greater authority and legitimacy. And what we've seen in the United States over the past couple months is that protests not only are happening in many places where they have not happened before, certainly anti-racist protests like, like we've seen have not been happening in many small towns or rural areas until 2020. And we're also seeing that the protests, not only are they large in size, but the, the number of people, uh, or the, the, the members of the crowds are quite diverse in, in terms of race and class and gender and other indicators. And so the geographic and, and demographic diversity is also combined with a focus on um, center city or downtown locations. They're not necessarily happening in the uh, black neighborhoods that have been the focus of protests even five or six years ago in, in previous rounds of Black Lives Matter protests. Instead, they're focused on um, uh, municipal buildings, federal buildings, as well as um, uh, high-end shops and, and shopping districts. Throughout the protests, we've also seen, of course, the introduction of chemical weapons, tear gas, and, and other types of, of, of um, munitions and, and various weapons that have, have been causing grievous injuries to a lot of people. But in a way, the, the introduction of these types of weapons um, has also backfired in some sense, because as many protesters have said, particularly in Portland, after the first, you know, the first time you, you, you have a, a flashbang grenade go off near you, it's, it's terrifying. But the fifth or sixth time, you know, five or six days in a row that it happens, that effect of, of scaring protesters no longer really works. So protesters are becoming um, more unified, more audacious as police are, you know, increasing their um, aggression toward the protests and trying to um, prevent them from occurring in the first place. And finally, the, 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 the last thing that, that I would say is that the, just as we saw in, in this, this history that, that I've, I've looked at you know, in, in my work 50 years ago in um, Latin America, and particularly in Uruguay, what we've seen in, in the recent protest is that the protesters themselves are focused obviously on police, on police tactics and are making the content of their protests about um, very specific demands related to police. Obviously, the, the slogan that has mo been most widely used is defund the police, which of course has some ambiguity in terms of what it actually means. But I think that the pattern that has emerged is that police are responding to the content of the protest rather than the form. Typically, when protest occurs, if it's blocking traffic, if it's um, you know, shutting down parts of a city, police are interested in you know, restoring order, as, as we just heard in the previous presentation. Um, they're interested in, in you know, getting commerce to, to function normally, traffic to flow normally, and so forth. I think in the protests over the past two months, that has not been the primary goal of police. Instead, police are focusing, as I said, on the content, they're responding in a kind of deeply politicized way to what protesters themselves are saying, rather than merely on, on the tactics themselves. And this it has created a further cycle of escalation rather than de-escalation. So the, the, the history, I think, suggests that uh, you know, a cycle of, of escalation and aggressive and offensive response rather than defensive response to protests, you know, leads to um, innovative tactics by, by protesters. It can also lead to um, underground and, and illegal tactics that I think, you know, many people are obviously uh, worried about, but I think it's really important to recognize that, um, you know, that is not what we're seeing yet in, in the United States, but we are seeing this really harsh and, and aggressive um, police response. And, and 
um, the, the pattern that we see in history is that this, this is very hard to de-escalate once the cycle begins. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Stuart, thank you very much. Um, sorry to anybody listening, if they can hear sirens outside, that's not sound effects or mood music. It's just uh, a busy road. Um, okay, let, let's move on now then to uh, Sizwe and Pufu Walsh. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution in advance. Thanks very much, Ben. Hopefully the sirens aren't a sign of repressive tactics either. Um, glad to be with you all. Thanks very much for the invitation and um, also very glad to be part of this panel um, and some, some very interesting interventions um, that we've heard already. So South Africa is held by many observers to be the protest capital of the world. Um, and this is often uh, thrown about in the South African public discourse. Um, I think what it alludes to, whether it's true or not, is that South Africa as a country with both widely protected constitutional freedoms and also severe material challenges is a unique melting pot for a very fractious democracy um, with anywhere between a million and two million people on the streets in any given year. And that's the country which I come from. But I also recently spent, as Ben alluded to, seven years at the University of Oxford, first doing an MPhil and then a DPhil. And if South Africa is the world's capital of protest, um, Oxford is the world's capital of polite discussion over tea and scones. And so in some ways, you, you couldn't get two more contrasting places um, in which protests happen. And so it, it's within the context of that set of contrasting experiences that I'd like to reflect on the story of Roads Must Fall at Oxford and its links to the history of protest in South Africa in a very important and present global moment of protest that we've been alluding to in, in the, the early parts of this discussion. And I had a front row seat, of course, in this Roads Must Fall in Oxford movement because I was um, one of many activists, but also because I've been at Oxford for, for quite a long time. I got to see both the first wave of Roads Must Fall, which appeared to be unsuccessful. And then I've been able to watch in some delight as a new wave very recently has borne more obvious and immediate fruit. So what I'll do is just briefly recapitulate the story of Roads Must Fall to give you a bit of grounding and context. And then after that, what I'll do is try and reflect on some lessons from Roads Must Fall in the international context. And then finally, enter some caveats and, and some qualifications about the story that might also be useful for our discussion going forward. So let me begin with Roads Must Fall in Oxford. Um, all I can say is it was the definition of, and has been the definition of a wild ride. In March, 2015, a South African student by the name of Tumani Matwele hurled a bucket of human feces at a statue of imperialist Cecil John Rhodes, which was at the center of the University of Cape Town, which was a university that I also attended. And this sparked an uprising in the student body, which came to be known as Roads Must Fall and morphed into a movement called Fees Must Fall and resulted amongst other things in the removal of this very prominent statue at the center of the University of Cape Town. And a number of Southern Africans, black British students, African-American students at Oxford at the time were watching on as this was unfolding in South Africa and pondering on the strange fact that a similar statue of Cecil Rhodes was placed right at the epicenter of the Oxford city center overlooking the high street, uh, placed as, as Rhodes had requested both above the clergy and the royal family on the third story of the Rhodes building. 
And we began to think along the following lines. If it was unacceptable for Rhodes to stand in the place where he committed his crimes, then why should he be left in the place where he bequeathed the loot? Um, why should he be left to stand? And so we beg began to think that we might be able to, in some ways, mimic and in certain respects, draw inspiration from the Roads Must Fall movement in South Africa and actually launch a Roads Must Fall movement in the epicenter um, of empire, as we saw it right in Oxford University. And uh, just to share um, an image of what that looked like in the early early part, you'll see, unfortunately, it's quite a, a blurry image. It wasn't taken with any media cameras at the time, but that was the first Roads Must Fall protest. Um, I'll show you the second one just now. And all we thought was hopefully we would spark a debate. We certainly knew we were contending against, you know, great forces within Oxford that would, that would resist this. And it seemed um, over the process of a number of months and, and, and hard battles that eventually Oxford would dig its heels in and decide that nothing would happen with the road statue. And it eventually did take such a decision in January, between December 2016 and January 2017, that the statue would not be touched. And uh, throughout the process, students were largely caricatured as a group of juvenile, um, politically correct attention seekers. And many students left Oxford with their hats in their hands and um, their, their reputation severely diminished and uh, the statue of Rhodes still standing. Fast forward to this year, I'm sure many of you will have seen that in the wake of the George Floyd moment, this catapulted the question of roads in Oxford right to the forefront of, of the British media agenda. And within weeks, Oriel College, one of the most obstinate institutions in the history of the world, um, and I say that because it only admitted women into the college as late as 1984. This is a 700 year old institution. So you can imagine the difficulty of trying to move an institution like this within weeks. Oriel College bowed to the demand um, for the Statue of Rhodes to be, to be removed. And where you saw the earlier picture, this was the picture of, of the protests um, of a few months ago, which doesn't quite tell the full picture um, because you know we had a, a huge spectacle of a protest which caused this. What does this tell us very briefly I think the lesson that can be drawn, one lesson that can be drawn is that there is more and more a global economy of protest methods, particularly around anti-racism protests that, that is being shared and that we can see being shared. And so the lines between those protests, the very obvious inspirations that are being drawn between protesters in South Africa, protesters in the United Kingdom, protesters in the United States, um, in the university setting, for example, are, are, are brought into sharp focus. And in fact, the directions of those inspirations often run counter to traditional colonial narratives of center inspiring periphery. And in fact, the inversion is, is true in this case. But secondly, I think it's also a story of the non-linearity non non um, of protest. And and of what Stuart referred to, I think, as the cyclicality of protest. What strikes me as fascinating about Roads Must Fall in Oxford is just how one wave seemed to dissipate as quickly as it began, disappeared from view, and then a full five years later sprung into, into being and achieved its ends you know, at light speed in comparison to the to the earlier iteration. And I think there's something interesting uh, to be gained by analyzing the success of protest, not in its immediate 
outcomes. But in the seeds it may plant for a non-linear and a non-cyclical fruition. And of course that applies to the dangers of protest as equally as it does to um, its opportunities. So I, I think in, in, in some, the roads must fall moment shows us not only the importance of the methods of protest used in centering the statue, the inspirations gained from different parts of the world and the non-linearity of those protests, but also shows us how in many important respects, a place like South Africa with a fractious history of protest can come to influence a place as apparently um, idyllic and quiet as Oxford and in many ways turn it upside down. Thanks. Suze, thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, thank you all three of you for your contributions so far. Um, we have some questions coming in in the Q&A box. Please uh, keep those questions um, coming in. Uh, I have a few that I'm going to put to our panel first, um, just to um, massage my own curiosity. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much for this so far. I, I would like to um, sort of go back to front actually in terms of in terms of speaker order and I was just wondering this way just to pick up on on the uh, the methods question that you were that you were reflecting on with the roads must fall campaign um, I wondered whether that's um, this the question the well the fact rather that you focused um, your efforts in this campaign on the removal of a specific statue and that you were able to you had like a specific tangible sort of realizable demand. I wonder whether that is, um, whether you see that as a potential sort of differentiation between um, that protest and maybe the wider Black Lives Matter movement. Something that I'm, I've been wondering about is whether the call to break down um, the institutions of systemic racism, absolutely a, a, a sort of key concern in societies across the world, but but does that almost let people off the hook because it is not directly sort of a specific tangible action? Like it's, it's something that everybody can agree with. You know, of course, systemic racism is bad and we can get on board with that. But then the kind of what next question maybe is something that isn't answered as loudly or maybe the media don't uh, focus on, on those specific actions. So I was just wondering whether you think that actually when we're, constructing protest movements in the future, we should be thinking very much about kind of tangible specific things, or is that too limiting? I uh, just wondered if you wanted to come in on that. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I think there, there are a number of really interesting responses to that question in, in the light of Roads Must Fall. So if we look at the, the methods used, I think two things stand out. The first is, as you say, this use of a symbol as a totem for a wider set of debates. And the second is this question that you speak about, which is uh, people's purported agreement with the aims. So let me deal with each of those because I think they're interesting insights on both. What I think the central insight of Roads Must Fall in Oxford was, as it was in the University of Cape Town, was that there had been a set of ongoing debates. We were by no means the first set of students who had uh, contested the heroic um, glorification of uh, figures of empire and their link to racism in the present. But the, the problem was firstly in attracting enough attention to that question so that appropriate pressure could be brought to bear on the institution. And secondly, in, in some ways simplifying that question in a way in which multiple conversations could be had around one symbol, as opposed to several conversations without the same force. Now, there are some costs to that because what you gain in attention, you may lose in nuance. But our bargain, and, and I think the, the success of, of this movement in comparison to previous, previous attempts in Oxford shows that you can use a central image and a central theme 
as a way to have multiple conversations and that that's a useful strategy often, especially when that image attracts um, such antipathy. But I think there's, there's a, another and a very important question that you raise, which is the problem at the moment, and this alludes to, to, to what both Nadine and Stuart were saying about um, adaptation and, and how you know, these both resistance and protest metastasizes is that it's all too easy now for people to purport to stand in solidarity with um, racial justice. And people have developed black belts in using all the right language, you know, um, around gender or around queer people or around race. The question though is when push comes to shove, what happens in an institution? And so I think the real insight of Roads Must Fall was to say, how do we cut through all this flowery language and make push come to shove? How do we center a, a specific icon in such a way that people can't revert to flowery language but have to decide the issue that's, that's visceral before them? And only I think once you cut through this buffer layer can you really see where an institution lies on a question? And so I think strategically going forward, it's important for all of us to think about how you, how you uh, pierce the veil of, of the language of solidarity. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, we've got a couple more questions coming in, but I just wanted to pick up something with you, Stuart, before we go to that, um, which, um, and forgive me for if, if, if this seems like a sort of brief question, um, but obviously a lot of the um, content that you focused on in, in your talk was um, around policing methods and um, the extent to which there's been a, a kind of militarization of, of policing um, in the US and elsewhere um, in recent times has been much discussed uh, in the media. I just wondered whether the events of this summer are revealing that kind of legislation around the use of force by police um, or regulation at least around it um, is kind of lagging behind the practice um, in this in this sort of area. I mean, there are all sorts of um, regulations and conventions and, and international law on the use of force by the military in battle spaces. Um, but is there work that needs to be done um, in sort of regulating the domestic battle space if we want to like it's not a nice idea but it seems to be the way that it's that it's going so yeah i just wondered if you had a view on that yeah thanks um obviously domestic battle space is is a, a term that that came up in 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 july um with the trump administration um and and i think that that does kind of give a sense of how um law enforcement is um has become militarized in, in ways that might not uh, only have to do with their kind of outward appearance or their tools or technologies, but also with a, a certain kind of mindset or, or ideological approach toward um, protest and, and even toward democracy. I think that the, the question you raise about, um, you know, limitations on use of force, absolutely there are um, a number of efforts, both longstanding and new efforts to restrict police use of force to outlaw certain um, techniques, you know, chokeholds and so forth. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I think that there's a, a great deal of skepticism, certainly among protesters, as well as people who've been following um, these issues, that these types of limitations actually will be successful. And, and one of the fundamental reasons is that the core characteristic of policing is discretion. Police officers um, on patrol, police officers on the street and in their kind of everyday activities retain a great amount of discretion to decide kind of in the moment how to deal with a given situation. And it's, it's very hard to imagine a set of legal restrictions that um, could operate within the bounds of, of what police deem to be their necessary you know, prerogative or discretion um, and also prevent some of the, the types of, of uh, injuries and deaths that, that we've seen. 
I think this is a basically an irresolvable paradox um, that is specific to policing because of the the kind of design and structure and and you know centuries old history uh, of the institution that that allocates so much discretion at the low, lowest levels. You know, in contrast, in the military, soldiers um, don't operate with with a huge amount of discretion because they generally have to you know follow orders and, as you say, have have certain types of rules of engagement. Um, that's that's a that's a contrast where I think that. Um, the, the metaphor of militarization of policing um, doesn't quite help us understand or explain what's occurring on, on, on the streets because this is a, a real distinction to be drawn. So I, I, I don't think there is any clear answer. I'm sure it's going to be the case that people will continue to ask for restrictions on use of force, um, whether that will actually reduce or, or eliminate the types of abuses that, that we've seen and that have pushed protesters into the streets, I think is, is quite unlikely. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely. And now Nadine, I just wondered, um, again, sorry to uh, take up this time, but um, I had a couple of thoughts for you. One was um, on this question of the depoliticization efforts of the, the UK state um, as regards protest movements. I found your argument about, um, about that very compelling, but I wondered whether you think that to, rather than just pointing out that it is um, a practice that has a lot of problems, whether protest movements need to sort of take account of it more and take account particularly of the PR costs of engaging with methods that they know are going to be presented in a certain way by the state, whether these methods are going to be vilified as looting and portrayed as, as kind of troublemakers. Is there, is there ever an extent to which um, the movements themselves should be going, we're going to get like condemned for doing this um, and it's not going to help our cause in the long run um, um, as regards trying to change public opinion. Um, and apologies, I've got another a, a question as well on that, which is just, um, I wanted to ask if, if we could kind of speculate a little bit and imagine something different. I wondered whether you had a vision or an understanding um, of how state institutions could take account of protest movements rather than depoliticizing them and, and portraying them as troublemakers. What would it look like to have a system where protest movements are kind of legitimate stakeholders in political discussion? Um, so two questions there. Thanks. Um... Well, I mean, on the first one, no, I don't think that protest movements should be concerned about how they'll be presented when they choose, particularly, I suppose you're talking about kind of direct action methods of protest. I mean, what we've seen is that it, it, tend, it, it is direct action methods of protest that actually bring about transformative um, um, outcomes. Um, we can look at several instances throughout history where um, insurgencies rebellions, uprisings have started with the commission of what would be understood as a crime, um, as being something against the law, but is it, it itself um, it is an act of protest that starts a movement that sees change, um, if not in the long linear or immediate term, as Cicero was saying, but um, um, in time. And, and so I think, I think it would be counterproductive for the protest movements that we are talking about and concerned about to be um, changing tactics according to how the state is going to respond to them. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is that protest movements often adopt tactics that might be seen as being defensive or constructed as violent precisely because of police action and, and tactics at protests. Um, there's a lot of research on crowd behavior, for example, which I think Stuart also was, was um, referring to a, a bit in his talk about how, you know, pe pe crowds are not these um, uh, uh, wild and mob-like um, um, uh, entities, but actually um, form as collectives in response to um, the way in which they're treated by police present at protests. And so if, if they're charged with horses or if they're hit with batons, they will form collectives and come together and, 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 and defend themselves, essentially. And this is a real problem in the way in which the law constructs um, protesters as being either peaceful or violent and attending protests um, with an intention to either be peaceful or violent. And, and this kind of touches on one of the questions that I can see from, from, from 
uh, somebody in, in the chat around Keir Starmer because, um, you know, it's unsurprising to see his um, uh, cr critical or sort of um, cowardly kind of uh, response in relation to the Black Lives Matter protest because it, um, it, it's unsurprising if we think about his history as the director of public prosecutions at the time when we saw the riots, when we saw the student protests I was talking about. Um, he, he wrote the, the, the guidelines, the rule book on when to prosecute protesters. And, and key in that rule book is the idea that protesters will be prosecuted, um, will, are more likely to be prosecuted where they intended, where they come to a protest intending to be violent. But that, of course, is not how violence um, starts at protests. Um, what happens is that the police, um, and in particular, these, these guidelines were written in the wake of the student fees protests, and, re and really, um, there's a lot of research, for example, by somebody called Chris Cocking, a crowd behavior specialist, who interviewed protesters who attended. And, and, and they would say things like, well, we were just standing, we were a static crowd, and all of a sudden, horses charged, we felt we needed to have a go back. Um, and unfortunately, the courts haven't been helpful either. The case of Austin in the UK, which was the case that kind of rubber stamped the use of kettling. Um, in, in 2012, you know, just as the Olympics um, were coming to Britain, and, and, and it was sort of you know, it was kind of felt by commentators that maybe the, the, the courts were concerned to take away a key uh, tactic from, from, from the police at a time when disorder was expected around the Olympics. Um, and of course, the, the gentrification and the, and the, the, um, that, that was entailed and, and the, the heightening of surveillance and police um, operations around that time. Um, and what we saw is, 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 is a, it, it was the court saying, uh, was looking at the case of, of the May Day demonstrations of 2001 and saying, yes, people were kettled for nine hours, no access to water, um, their liberty seemingly constrained, but they nevertheless found it to be um, justified. And I'm not going to go into details in terms of the critique, but one thing that they didn't consider was that the violent minority, which the state was saying, well, the police have to keep the cordon in place because of uh, the existence of violent minority within the crowd, there was no violence prior to the cordon having been put in place. And actually the violence started after the cordon was put in place and people saw rightly that their freedom was being um, um, constrained um, and, and wanted um, to, to, to react against that and, and did indeed, um, some, some people did react against that. But that's not considered by the courts. And I think that's really the fundamental problem with um, the way in which um, uh, protesters are, are protests are seen. The violence is only considered in 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 the sort of shot that the media get of the violence taking place, without really thinking about well, how did that violence start and what are the roots of that violence. Um, but I don't think that the, the answer should be that um, protesters should refrain from looting or refrain from uh, um, any kind of direct action protest, um, because I think that we have to think. Um, about the work that the law does in keeping the very systems of injustice in place and the um, the the violence in everyday society, uh, the, the, the material um, violence in terms of people access to the basic means of life, housing, um, uh, food, um, um, clean air, all of these things are a result of laws in place and, and the efforts state, state authorities make to, to ensure that they're enforced. Um, and so if we think something about something like looting, I mean, um, as this were mentioned, I mean, here, uh, Br Britain is, is, is loot, essentially, is colonial loot. I mean, that, that's essentially what it is, um, if we think about Britain in the context of its imperial history. And so when we say, oh, well, protests are loot protesters are looting, what's important is actually change the narrative, um, to change the discourse, and to ensure that, that we say, well, actually, what does it mean to loot, and, and what does it mean um, uh, to loot in a context where we're not just looking at what the law says about theft um, today, um, but thinking around questions of colonial theft and, and why certain groups are particularly dispossessed in the ways that they are today. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Chinzia de Santis. I just wonder um, if we unmute you, whether you'd like to ask that question directly. Hi. Um, hi, Ben. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, guys, for um, giving me the chance to ask the question. So basically, uh, I, um, I've been, uh, I am a Venezuelan and I've been living in the UK for 70 years, but since 20, 20 years ago, we started protesting against the government uh, in the streets of Venezuela and lots of students, university students, um, were involved in these protests. Um, they have been, a lot of them also have been tortured, have been harassed, have been killed. 
Uh, many are in exile here in the UK as well. So we basically now the Venezuelan people are, are giving up hope uh, over change or improvement or free elections. So there is, do you think there is any chance, thinking about the non-linearity of uh, protests, do you think there is any chance that things might change? There is any chance that at some point Venezuelan people might gain their freedom? Cynthia, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know whether we should go to uh, Stuart or Siswe, or maybe both of you, but maybe Stuart, would you like to have an answer of that first? Well, I, I, I don't know that I can speak specifically about the situation in, in Venezuela, um, you know, except to say that, that I, you know, it, I'm not sure exactly what 20, 20 years means, because um, if, if we're talking about how um, Hugo Chavez became president, um, you know, it strikes me that that, that was on the backs of, of, of a long-standing social movement. Um, and then, you know, there, there still is a movement, um, obviously, that is, is, is um, maybe not happy with, with the current regime, but um, the, the people who, who are in that movement um, still exist. So I, I do think that it does suggest, on the other hand, that, um, you know, there is, there is a, a clear difference between um, protesting, you know, being in the streets, mobilizing, demonstrating, and governing. Um, but, you know, I, I also don't think that, that there is a, a clear cut answer um, for what protesters should do and what protest tactics should look like that, you know, will translate into um, the, you know, kind of achievement of, of state power down the road. I, I, I think that, you know, there, it's, it's obviously a very complicated relationship um, and, and set of questions, you know, looking, I was, I was raising Uruguay in my remarks earlier, you know, looking at the, the history of Uruguay, you know, some of the people who were the protesters who experienced really deep repression during the 1960s and 70s, um, after the military dictatorship ended, they then went on to govern and, and I think many people um, many observers from around the globe, you know, felt that the, the transformation from military dictatorship to a more liberal and, and um, free society uh, was, was stark and remarkable. But for some of those people, it may have felt like the realization of, of, of some of the, the demands that they were asking for, you know, decades earlier. So, you know, these are very long and, and complicated processes. And it's, it's, it's challenging to um, kind of come up with a, a blueprint or a cookie cutter answer to, to how particular protest movements um, might ultimately uh, set themselves up for, for taking state power. And that's, that's a quite a large question to answer. Uh, thanks very much, Stuart. And uh, Suzwe, would you like to have the last word on this? Sure, I, I think I'd, I'd, I'd also probably like to side, sidestep the the deeper politics of of of, of Venezuelan protest, um, because I'm not a specialist on the subject, and and I think it's it's a, an intricate um, and an ambiguous um, situation. But what I think the question gets at is is this notion of nonlinearity um, to which I referred earlier, and I think on that score, what I would say, and what I what I actually also wanted to say um, to flesh that notion out a little bit. Is, is first that sort of outright swift revolution is, is extremely rare um, historically. And so we're almost always talking about partial victories and gray areas and ambiguities when we're talking about protests. And so the notion um, of, of a romantic linear protest, which begins, ends and achieves its goals is more of an ideal type than an actual reality. And that's complicated further by the fact that we've been referring a lot to protests with which we broadly agree here. But of course, there are also protests for deeply regressive causes that can use exactly the same, uh, the same methods. And so often you get uh, a clashing of different ideals using similar methods. And that, that adds to the non-linearity non and the complexity of the situation. Um, but I do think what the relationship between protests in different parts of the world shows is that not only is there 
a nonlinear, albeit nonlinear relationship temporally with protests about the same things, but also spatially. So that one protest which fails in one place may actually spark a successful protest at a later date in another place. And I think that also needs to be borne in mind. Sizwe, thank you very much for that. Yeah, and um, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending today and for your questions. Um, and thanks in particular to, to our panelists, Nadine, Stuart, Sizwe. It's been really, really fascinating to hear your thoughts on this and to range so widely over all of those different historical examples as well. Um, I hope it's given everybody some food for thought. Um, and I guess all that's left for me to say is uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us and uh, see you soon at the next Chatham House event. Thanks very much.